recording and hello everybody today we're going to be talking about a wonderful contemporary philosopher of science who actually is bringing us plenty of nice things in face of many new challenges in philosophy and in science in particular so the person we're going to be talking about today is a french philosopher called edgar morin uh, this person is actually quite impressive. He was born in Paris, in France, as Edgar Nahum. He was uh, Nahum, actually, we pronounced. He is a Judeo Spanish per, uh, from Judeo Spanish parents who went migrated from Greece. He's Sephardic. Uh, he has degrees in history, economics, law, but he's also a philosopher of science who contributed to so many different fields. You can have them listed in front of you. He has over 60 books in so many diverse fields, and he's still alive and still writing books to this, to this day. You guys could actually communicate with him if you want, and I believe he also speaks English because he's written some things in English. So... Did you really mean that or is Ahmed wrong? <laughs> and he'll let you know. So let's go. First of all, today's problem, the problem that Edgar Morin is uh, talking about is called reductionism. Let's look at this brilliant, very, very accurate picture of a duck. Uh, as we all know, René Descartes, uh, in his book, De Homine on Humanity, uh, talked about how uh, non-humans can be summed up in their mechanical way as automata. I am going to ask you guys very plainly, is this doc accurate? Well, last time I dissected a doc, it didn't look like this. This is called reductionism. Attempting to define everything by mechanical principles, the principles of motion, and we're trying to, as you see here, he reduced everything about the duck's leg into just the ability to move, and also as well uh, the foot, I don't remember what the foot of the duck is called. So certainly there's much left to be desired here. There's very little given attention to in the, how the duck eats, how the dog breathes, how the dog has circulation. There are so many systems here that are simply ignored in favor of what he believes is important. And also, as we can see, like the brain is empty. This is reductionism. Reductionism is a series of problems in modern philosophy. Can you guys, before we look at this, this also impacts science heavily. Can you guys tell me, what do you think is meant by reductionism. If you want to speak, please raise your hand and I will let you unmute. Otherwise, you could definitely type. progressive dissection of information into smaller bits. Yes, 100% yes. Reductionism attempts itself into smaller bits. Anything else? Of course, we know reduction comes from the verb to reduce, which means to make smaller. So that's definitely one way of looking at it. But there's also more to it than that. There are many aspects. Let's see. Isolation of factors. That's 100% true. The reductionist view attempts to look at each factor independently from the other, the rest of the other factors and independently from the general whole. You're right. And also, let me take you from isolating one factor into a similar one, which is trying to explain everything using a, a single factor or a single law or a single theory, attempting to sum it up as much as possible in a way. And while this could be true in certain aspects, attempting to say that only one 
reason is responsible for a huge thing is definitely wrong in terms of reduction, in terms of what's outside reductionism. More problems that are uh, characteristic of reductionism is you have a closed cause effect possibility. And in this case, you are saying that what I deduced will work in every single situation. This is uh, you know, more, most famously um, critiqued by the And what works for the atom does not work for the planet. There are macro and micro, and each one has a different level of work that it works at, different laws, different things. So assuming that what works for the atoms works for the planets is a false assumption. Another symptom of reductionism is picking the simplest theory. Now, of course, there are many different things called reductionism, but these are the most general ones that Edgar Morin mentioned. Picking the simplest theory, when you have several theories that attempt to explain the same thing, you say, hmm, now that one is easier. And I'm going to give you some examples in a bit, so don't worry. And another thing is that you will have generalization. Now, this one's pretty obvious, trying to generalize, attempting to attribute everything to one reason, as we mentioned earlier. And as Ayman mentioned before, belief in an, uh, uh, in an organ, uh, believing that uh, something can be attributed to one reason, as we mentioned, there's also believing in an organized system. Now, the problem with this isn't that there is no organized system. There are definitely organized systems. Many things in life are organized in systems. But if you are looking specifically for an organized system without having enough data, you are leaving a lot to risk. And also, as we will talk about in a bit, there are new discoveries in science that will make you hesitate before you say that there is an organized system and a creative way of design to everything you're looking at. The final assumption is that the whole is not greater than the parts. In other means, as we mentioned, as Ayman mentioned earlier, if we have this uh, progressive dissection of information, we start from each bit of information. And if we understand, for example, the liver and the small intestine and the large intestine, we're going to understand the digestive system. Wrong, even if you understood, even if you understood and studied every single part of it, if you did not study the system as a whole, there is much left to be desired. And this is the primary problem we're going to be talking about. Now, reductionism has been at the forefront of science throughout its history. For example, pre-Socratic uh, philosophers who are considered the pre-runner of history, uh, of uh, science in a way, they attempted to find the origin of the world, the origin of everything. They called it the Arche, uh, which is Greek for the beginning or origin. They tried, maybe some of them said fire, some of them said water, some of them returned it to a single uh, principle, but all of them made the same reductionist mistake, which is assuming that there's only one origin to all of things. Why should it be only fire or only water? Why not both? Another one, now we're moving closer to the modern era, Copernicus, you know, the guy who talked about the geocentric model, believing that the sun is fixed and the earth orbits the sun instead of the opposite, which was the heliocentric. Uh, I'm sorry, he proposed the heliocentric model, which is that the sun is in the middle. I'm sorry, this was a problem here. I made a typo. He proposed the heliocentric model. The sun is the center of the universe and not the earth is the center of the universe as they used to believe. But the problem is, while he's absolutely right and we have proved this, the problem is how he reached this conclusion. He simply looked at multiple equations for how the orbits are uh, calculated for each object in the, in the solar system. And he simply said that the calculations are easier if we deduce that the sun is the, is the center of this orbit. This is reductionism. He's saying that we're simply choosing the simplest theory. He didn't prove anything. He didn't use a telescope like his, uh, like the people who have, came after him. He didn't try anything else. He simply said it's easier to predict the orbit if we if we believe that the sun is at the center. 
And later, we needed more concrete proof in order to prove that the sun is indeed the center of our solar system. Newton, moving even closer to our modern era, Newton assumes that the mechanical laws can apply to the planet on the macro scale, on the big scale, and also to everything small in our, plan in our planet like balls or whatnot, and also at the micro level. This is a bad assumption that's been disproved several times after that. Uh, this is also reductionism because it's assuming that what works for once will work for everything else, right? And he also attempted to explain everything in terms of his mechanical laws, even humanity. And uh, the, his successors made so many mistakes because they worshipped Newton and they believed that the mechanical laws of Newton are absolutely correct and can be used to explain everything, even humanity and how it moves. And there was a lot of pseudoscience that came after Newton for this reason. Even Einstein, who did disprove a lot of this Newtonian physics, and he said for the general and special relativity that can be used in physics, we will explain this in a bit. Even these things, he denied spontaneity and he exclaimed that there is no dice being rolled at any point. This means that what works once will work every single time, including for things that we are, didn't explore yet. So there are still, there's still a lot to be desired, but of course, general relativity is, as far as science is concerned, absolutely usable and explains things much better than Newtonian physics, of course. Now, Edgar Morin presents to us a view of the world that explains why reductionism in the symptoms that we mentioned earlier doesn't work. The world is dynamic and changing. What worked before might not work again. And this is chiefly observed in, uh, for example, in quantum physics, when, for example, a particle changes uh, if it's being observed or not. So there's a lot of dynamic uh, changes that are happening here and you can't believe that if you stop observing then it's going to look at the same as when you're observing this is a major problem he also believes that everything in the world is structured and complex as we mentioned earlier there are many systems to everything the structure is greater the whole is greater than the sum of the parts not just the digestive system isn't just the liver the small intestine the big intestine and all of that no the digestive system is a huge array of, uh, of organs that are working together, enzymes, everything. It cannot be reduced to simply the organs that make up the digestive system. He also believed that the, that the world is spontaneous as inspired by quantum physics that tells us in certain parts that we are not able to predict everything accurately. Now, of course, this is where you might disagree with Edgar Moulin. We're not saying that this is 100% true, but this is what he believed. He believed there is no intelligent design in the world. The world is not intelligently designed. It happens spontaneously and everything fits perfectly together. Now, the modern physics is still debating this, and I'm not sure, I'm not having caught up in the past few years about this, so if you guys know about this, please let me know. I'm not sure if modern physics has completely disapproved intelligent design of the world just yet. I'm not sure. You guys will have to let me know. Another thing that Edgar Morin tells us is that the world is uncertain and unexplored. This cannot be designed, cannot be denied. Every single philosopher or every single scientist who says that, okay, this is the solution, this is the answer, is undeniably making a mistake. The philosopher or the scientist should say, this is an interpretation, this is a theory, and it might be proven wrong. And in fact, Newton was proven wrong. Many of the older scientists were proven wrong, so you can always be uncertain of something. And there's a lot left to be discovered. We haven't discovered most of the universe just yet. Contextualized and global. There is a huge system that has, the context plays into it, all of it, and every, there is an effect of each part on the other part in a global system that uh, employs almost everything. So you can't just work on just that. Also, the world is multidimensional, and we don't, ju don't just mean this in terms of the three dimensions and time and space and all that. We mean that everything can be studied in multiple perspectives. If you study the human, psychologically, it's different than when you study it sociologically, although 
this is the solution that Edgar Moran is presenting to us. He says that we should actually attempt to look at all of the perspectives at once. This is part of the complex, which we will get to in a second. Uh, yeah, the complex. Okay, before we get to the complex then, reductionism of concepts has been prevalent throughout science. It's always attempted to reduce things to laws, such as Newton's laws and Kepler, who also call their theories laws. But modern science doesn't like to call them theories anymore. It doesn't like to call them laws anymore. It likes to call them theories. And there is a big reason for this. Uh, in Aristotelian ontology, which is the science of what is, as long as it is, the science of what is that is, <laughs> it's complicated. Ontology tries to assign everything in essence, a reason, a cause, a meaning, and a lot of things. And According to Edgar Morin, this isn't true. We are going into the realm of metaphysics. I mean, we might say this, you might believe that something has a purpose, you might believe that something has a meaning, but you're basically assigning it, this point. And also what is witnessed now, according to, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the problem with this is that what is witnessed now and the problem of induction will always happen whenever the circumstances are met. This is a problem. There's nothing that guarantees that this will happen, but it's always an assumption that's being followed. And this is reductionist, by the way. Now, the last thing that we should talk about before we move on about here to. is that contradictions in most of the history of science are believed as a way to know that your theory is wrong when you reach a when you reach a contradiction. However, modern science knows that this is always a bad sign. Heraclitus, which was one of the earlier pre-Socratics, by the way, he knew that contradiction wasn't always a bad thing. It was basically the beginning of uh, uh, complementary theories, in a sense. Uh, fuzzy logic, a new version of logic now, has a state that's between true or false. There are multiple states between true or false. Nothing ha has to be only true or only false. Contradictions aren't viewed as absolutely wrong. And of course, in quantum mechanics, we have Schrodinger's cat. You know, uh, in Schrodinger's, uh, the Copenhagen interpretation of Schrodinger's cat tells us that if we leave a cat with this beautiful apparatus here, where the hammer would actually smash the poison once the Geiger counter, which the Geiger counter, if you don't know, measures the radiation being left off. So the hammer will be released by the scissors here, if we see it. Once the Geiger counter reaches a certain level of radiation, then it will smash the poison. And of course, this is dependent on one factor, which is that the radioactive material decays. If it decays, then radiation will happen, the Geiger counter will turn on, the hammer will fall down, and it will smash the poison, and the cat dies. But maybe the material doesn't decay, and the cat lives. Or if the material decays, the cat dies. So the Copenhagen interpretation tells us, in this case, uh, Schrodinger's cat is both alive and dead at the same time, and this has has had so many repercussions in the fields of quantum mechanics because now there's a superposition of everything. We can be sure of the particles, especially at the very smaller particles like the like Max Planck's particle, for example. These are very small. I'm sorry, guys, if I make any mistakes in quantum physics, please let me know. There's a saying, of course, that if you under they think you understand quantum physics, then you probably misunderstood it. <laughs> So I might be wrong, I'm sorry. So going back, there are many scientific advancements that shattered the traditional views. The microphysics revolution, when we broke apart the nucleus of an atom and went into looking at the subatomic particles, it in itself was a revolution because it ended our perception of what we believe to be the smallest unit of matter, which was, of course, the atom. And then if we move into closer inside the nucleus of the atom, we're seeing a lot of things. Of course, general and special relativity of Einstein had so much impact. Uh, of course, general relativity is too huge for me to explain, but one of the things that I will mention here that would help us understand the general and specific relativity of Einstein without going into details, please research it, guys. 
I'm going to tell you about the twin paradox of Einstein, which basically goes on the principle that time is relative to everybody depending on the plane that you are measuring it with. So we have the twin paradox goes like this, right? One, two twins are of course born almost at the same time and they live their life up to a certain point experiencing time the same way. And then one of the two twins, which is the one in this case on uh, this side here, right here goes to space. And then it goes at the level, at the speed of light. It travels a certain distance as we see here. And then when the twin returns back to earth, it notices that however significant this difference is, the twin that went at the speed of flight and returned actually aged much slower than the twin who remained on earth. Why? Because time was passing differently between the two of them. Yes, time dilation, exactly. This had so many repercussions on tra traditional physics that believe to a certain extent, of course, that uh, time is fixed, basically. Aristotle didn't believe this. Uh, many of the earlier ones, like Copernicus, didn't believe this. They believed time was constant. And now Einstein came in and gave us the twin paradox, and everybody is mind blown. <laughs> Another advancement in science that also changed everything for us is, of course, the invention or the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry. For the longest time, 2,000 years or more of humanity's history, especially in regards to geometry, Euclid is believed to be absolutely right in so many things like the Euclidean theorem. You know, of course, we have this case, uh, we have that uh, the sum of this side, C power two is equal to A plus B, but then now we have non-Euclidean surfaces, we have a sphere, we have a hyperbolic surface. And these things have different ways. Even, even the Euclidean postulate, uh, even the thing that Euclid said that is true always, that the sum of angles is 180 is not always maintained in non-Euclidean geometry. Even this, this thing that we've been using our entire lives for the past 2000 years as something that's 100% true and can be disproven is now considered to be false. You have to see how huge this is on terms of geometry and in math in particular. So now absolutely we are in need of an epistemology that tackles this and enter complex thought. The complex, of course, comes from Latin, con and plecto. Con means with and plecto means to weave or braid, you know, like a fabric. Yeah, the complex, according to Edgar Morin is a fabric of differing and sometimes opposing elements that can't be separated. If complex can't be summed up in one word, according to him, it can't be assigned to a particular law nor reduced to a simple idea. The complex is a system. It's, a, it's more than the sum of its parts. The complex is studied not by dividing it into smaller parts, but by studying the whole complex in open thinking, as in being open to other fields with interdisciplinarity. The whole, as we mentioned, is bigger than the sum of the parts. Why? Because there's also the relationships between the parts, there's the structure between them. So there's more to it than what we're used to in uh, reductionist thinking. Now, the origin of the complex, if you want to understand how he reached the idea of the complex, and in order to really start the composition, you need to know where he got it from. Well, it's a culmination of several sciences. We have chaos theory, which is a field that claims that apparent irregularities in systems are actually explained by underlying patterns, like, you know, the butterfly effect. If, for example, in Texas, a butterfly flaps its wings, it could cause a hurricane in China. Why? Because smaller patterns can cause other things and the effect can become very global and cause so many things. This is called a butterfly effect and it's all part of the chaos theory. Cognitive psychology, of course, is a scientific study of mental processes such as remembering, language, creativity, computer sciences. There's evolutionary biology that studies, uh, you know, evolutionary biology. Fuzzy logic, as we mentioned earlier, 
deals with more than just true or false, like traditional logic. Uh, systems theory believes that the system is influenced by its environment and it has a structure and a purpose and it's expressed to its functioning. This is the basis of the complex once we get to it. Information theory, uh, theory studies the quantification and communication of information. All of these combined, especially chaos theory and uh, system theory and fuzzy logic, could help us understand how to deal with the complex and how to really create complex thought. Now, if you want to study this complex, this is a complicated topic. As we mentioned, we can't really sum up the concept of, of complexity because there's really no epistemological study for it and only one the philosopher of science, only one, Gaston Bachelard, ever really talked about it. So really there's not much uh, that's been paved. The road is not paved for us yet in order to talk about complexity itself. And really recognizing the complex is not an attempt to clarify it. We're not trying to explain it, but rather in his own words, the complex is not a concept. The complex is a question. It's not a complex, it's not a concept waiting for explanation, it's a question waiting for an answer. We must recognize the inability to clarify the, com the complex. And we must always, and this is what actually happens whenever we try to study the complex, according to Edgar Morin, studying it will always be accompanied by feelings of inability, feeling of inferiority, confusion, and all of these things. This is not something that's easy for us. It's, well, as the term implies, complicated. Now, complex thought does not attempt to go from the simple to the complex as we're used to. We don't start with the atom and going further than that. No, we start from complex to complex. The example I mentioned earlier, of course, is the articulatory system. We don't start with the articulatory system uh, we start from the archaeological system to the entire body rather than from, for example, one part of it. And here I actually meant to talk about digestive system when I said articulatory. I'm sorry, I'll correct this once I give you the PowerPoint presentation because here I mentioned the intestines, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, because I mentioned the liver, yeah. Now, the study of the complex should not be, sep should not be separate sciences as that is unfaithful to the very structure of knowledge. We should not keep it this way. So what usually happens is that, for example, biology studies the biological functions of humanity without looking into the sociological or the psychological aspect. Psychology doesn't look into the biology except when it really needs to. And this carries on and on until humanity is actually separated into so many different concepts. The, the humanity that is studied in biology starts being completely different than the humanity studied in psychology. It should be interdisciplinary. And here's the question about it. When we have interdisciplinary thinking onto multiple fields, we should be aware that, of course, we can mix into anything, but we should always be aware of the complexity of what we are dealing with. We shouldn't try to reduce humanity into simply its biological functions when we are studying it, for example. We should always acknowledge a particular aspect of it, even I'm not going to be talking about it directly. It's that he's talked about it. He's talked about it in so many books. You guys could read this. I've read one of them, and it was such a long read. I tried to sum up three primary principles of complexity. First one is circular causation. And traditional thinking, we believe there is a linear closed causation where A leads to B. But now, no. We believe in circular causation that causes and effects can occasionally switch roles. The cause can become an effect and the effect can cause a cause. For example, the example that for example, the language of the religious views, all of these things, even the folklore, the clothing, the social structures is a product of the history of these people, among other things, of course but also the history of the people is affected by its culture, definitely. So now each one is a product of the other and also the cause of the other at the same time. And refusing to announce this, if you don't look into the cultural reasons of the history, then you are making a fundamental mistake and the other way around, if you don't look into the historical aspect of the culture, then you're making a fundamental mistake. You should always be aware that circular causation always happens. 
A leads to B true, but also B can sometimes lead to A. And this holistic print way of looking into uh, the complexity at hand allows us to truly know what's going on. The second principle is the dialogical principle. Now, of course, in every human concept, every concept given by humanity, multiple logics and paradigms, a paradigm, of course, is a system of thinking, it can oppose each other and can be downright contradictory. But according to the dialogical principle, this shouldn't be treated as that. It should be a single complex unity. What are we talking about? We're saying that each one complements the other. And the best example of this is light, the particle wave duality of light. Sometimes we study light as a particle, the photon. Sometimes we study it as a wave. And depending on what you're looking for, you might use this or you might use that. The two views are, are contradictory, but they're also complementary. What the Garmoire wants us to do is to allow the ability to look into multiple different paradigms at the same time, such as the particle wave duality and light in physics. This is different than, say, the dialectics of Marx and Hegel, where they believe that, uh, for example, if some things are contradictory or opposing, they lead into a product. No, the productivity of these opposing views is that they can be complementary, not in that they can oppose each other and defeat one another, as happens with Marx, for example. The last principle we'll talk about when it comes to complexity is the hologramic principle. And uh, here I said homogramic, I'm sorry, it's hologramic. Both the whole and the part can be contained within one another. This sounds like a paradox. And really he loves phrasing things like a paradox, Bill is phrasing it like it's downright impossible, but really, the uh, biggest example of this is, of course, the genetic material in the DNA of each cell, you know, the DNA, contains information about the entire body, about the hair color, about the eye color, and all of that in every single cell. So now, in this case, we have the whole contained within the part. And just like how each person is a reflection of culture and society, and culture and society is a reflection of each of us. Whole, part, where the whole where the part and culture is the whole. See? Now, when it comes to applying the complex thought, it's still a seed of a method. It's not yet completely done. You can't really just apply it as it is. Right now, you have to apply the particular principles. For example, that a logical principle allows you to have synergy and interdisciplinarity when you want to study something in multiple views, multiple perspectives. Uh, like, for example, studying light in terms of particle and in terms of, uh, for example, uh, in terms of particle and in terms of wave. And this also uh, allows us to have accurate study of microphysical uh, structures within, uh, for example, the mechanical systems. This also, as we mentioned earlier, doesn't divide up humanity into, for example, homo sapiens in biology, homo economicus in economics, homo mythologicus in, myth, uh, in anthropology. Now we have one homo complexus. And especially in terms of human sciences, if you want to study humanity accurately, you cannot reduce it, you should consider that there are multiple differing aspects in humanity and there are complex aspects and should be obtained. The uncertainty and spontaneity principles can open the door for future expansion and critique of fixed ideas, such as, as I mentioned earlier, the critique of Euclidean geometry. Uh, right now, there is much left to be desired if we want to move on with complex thought. You really need to have so much more talking and really in his books, he gives us an outline of what we need to develop. He suggests several different sciences that we should uh, create, multiple sciences that we should invent in order to really be able to study the complex as it should be studied. But we all know that the applications of complex thought are humongous. But before we move on to that, are we really sure of the theoretical background? Now, of course, a lot of criticism can be presented to him, as you mentioned, or especially the thing that everything is always spontaneous. Some people might argue that the spontaneity, the spontaneity is merely not 
us not knowing about the particular dimensions left to it. And really quantum physics itself that really inspired him to have so many different ideas, especially spontaneity, still needs a lot of thinking as well. And before we move on into this, we need a science a philosophy of quantum physics first in order to study what it means to this. The Copenhagen uh, interpretation of the Schrodinger sketch is only one interpretation. And if we really want to really study it, we need to have a complete philosophy that studies it in multiple angles, you know, absolutely. There are many critiques to it. For example, reduction is, reduction is necessary. Abstract, abstraction, you can think of it instead of looking at every single, uh, every single part, every single instance, you can have easier testing. You could develop models, like you know the model of the atom, which is not always accurate, but it helps us definitely know how to look at it and certain things. And it can also be mathematically verified if you want. And this is the pinnacle of modern physics. So without testing and without making models that can be mathematically verified, what do we do? Physics requires some form of reduction. The problem isn't reduction itself, it's having too much reduction, you know? And we can take complexity to infinity either. You have to eventually reduce at some point. You have, some, you should know that what you're looking at is complex. That's 100% true. But really, if you are studying only the biological function, what do you need from the cycle, uh, from, for example, the sociological function? If you're just studying the liver, well, maybe there are some things like, you know, psychological reasons for psychosomatic problems in the body, for example, maybe it can happen. But if you're studying a particular thing, you don't really need to look at it from all angles. You know, there is, there's no need for us to go. And plus there's, there's a limit to how much one person can have interdisciplinary work. Now, Edgar Morin was a polymath. He had like three degrees. He had so many different sciences. He was so good at this, but not everybody is like this. You need to know that there are limits to how much interdisciplinarity we can do. You need group work. You need, for example, a physicist and a chemist to work together in order to obtain, to obtain the interdisciplinarity you need. You can't expect just one person to do it. The biggest problem in complex thought is that it's still a seed. More is needed. Fortunately, Edgar Morin still lives among us and we can still talk to him. And there's still a lot left to be done when it comes to complex thought. So really, before we try to critique complex thought, we should give it a chance to develop because right now it's just a seed. You don't really judge it free before it goes, do you? But the future of philosophy of science is still open. Maybe not complex thought, but it's for sure that the traditional beliefs are being shattered. There are many things in science that are changing. We can continue to live with the philosophy of science of Gaston Bachelard as it was. Right now, we need new advancements. And if it's not Edgar Morin, it can be someone else. The door is open and it needs to stay open as long as we can. Thank you everyone. If you have any questions, please let me know. So guys, uh, I wanted to tell you that uh, Flames of Prometheus is looking in order, to, in order to expand its horizons as much as we can. You know, it's a Lebanese initiative that aims to have uh, free lectures. It aims to spread knowledge for free. This is our, this is our philosophy. Really, we want to talk about we want to talk about philosophy. We want to talk about history, mythology, linguistics. These are my primary things. But also, we want to expand further than that. So, what I need from you is, if you're in the WhatsApp group or if you can communicate with me, you have my email flames of Prometheus events at gmail.com, or you can even go to the website. There's a way to contact us via the website, of course, flames of Prometheus.tk. From there, you could find our Instagram, which is also flames of Prometheus. We want you to follow us all of there and uh, for future events. And also more importantly than that, we want you to suggest new events, what you guys want to find out, what you guys want to learn, and in the future, we'll become maybe more cultured, better learned human beings for the betterment of ourselves and our planet. Thank you, everyone. I will see you next time.